I love it. Uh, thank you for coming. Today we're going to talk about a rescue mission. And if you think about it, that's kind of what last week was. Last week was a rescue mission. Jesus rescued us. I was thinking about that, you know, in, in my, my time in the fire service. We, we had plenty of rescue missions, if you will. Uh, one is, several of them stick out in my mind, but right before I retired, um, I remember one. We got a call, it was about 11.30 at night. Most of us had already passed out in our bunk, and um, we got the call, working structure fire. We were the first company on the scene. I was a lieutenant on a, on a 75-foot ladder truck, and as we pulled up, the back of the building was fully engulfed, and as I, I, we, I started to figure out what we were going to do, um, a man walked up to me and he said, there's an apartment upstairs and there's an older woman in it. So everything that I decided to do, I figured we are going to put some hose lines around the back and just try to push it back and keep it. So on the company I was with, I had my, en- my truck company and then I had a jump engine company. So I had five guys total. Told two guys, get me water, get the pump, get the hoses. One guy grabbed a hose line, put it to the back, and another guy went with myself, and we threw a ladder up, and we got the woman out. And just as she was literally coming out, and I'm not saying it's like backdraft or anything like that, but just as she was coming out, the room she was in lit up. We, we got lucky, to be very honest. Had we been 30 seconds longer getting out the door, I don't know what would have happened. If, if the guys didn't work, the, and I am taking no credit for this. The guys were amazing. But that was a rescue mission that I will never forget because it was imminent danger. 30 seconds, 15 seconds could have meant the difference in a rescue mission or a recovery. Now, many of you understand what that's like. That time can be just so important and that rescue missions happen every day. There's firemen, there's policemen, there's guys uh, in, the, in the military and, and countless others. Please don't think I'm limiting it to those. But there are many people every day that are on a rescue mission. But have you ever thought that as a Christian, you are on a rescue mission? Have you ever thought about that? Because honestly, once you've been rescued... Now you become part of the rescue team. You are to rescue others from burning. You're, you're kind of like firemen. No, that doesn't mean I'm going to cook good meals for you. That doesn't mean you get to sit in my recliner all day. And it certainly means you're not sleeping in my bed. So forget about it. But it does mean that you have signed up when you accepted the job. And, and how did you accept the job? Whether you realize it or not, when you gave your life to Christ. When, when you went into the watery grave as a sinner and came out clean. We talked about that last week, right? The, the, the white rock and the white robe that we'll receive one day when we get to heaven. But that just means that while we're down here, it's time to get dirty. It's time to get dirty. It's time to do the job that we are meant to do. Rescuing is of the utmost importance because here's the deal. 30 seconds from now, someone you know may be between a rescue mission and a recovery. That's the fact of life. We don't want to talk about it, But that's the fact of life. I could drop dead on the stage right now. And if I do, rejoice. For many reasons. One, you get a new pastor. And that's probably the first. But secondly, I will be where I want to go. I I don't want to leave my wife and kids. I don't want to leave you. But if you're asking me, no offense, don't take this rude. But if you're asking me, heaven or you guys, see ya, I'm out. I'm I mean that with love, though. I really do. Now, there's a quote here, and I don't know how to say his name. So it, it'll show up. It's Tulian Tikajivikajian. I have no idea how to say it. I looked it up for the last three days. I've practiced for the last three days. The last three days, I got it wrong. But this guy says this. The Bible is one long story of meeting our rebellion with his rescue. 
our sin with his salvation, our guilt with his grace, our badness with his goodness. The overwhelming focus of the Bible is not the work of the redeemed, but the work of the redeemer, which means that the Bible is not first in a re recipe of Christian living for, but a revelation book for Jesus, who is the answer for the unchristian living. I love that. The whole Bible is, is a love story. God wanting to rescue us back to him. There's nowhere that you can look in the Bible that, that isn't God moving, calling his people back. Now, did bad things happen? Does God allow bad things? Yes, he does. And why? Because we've gotten so arrogant that we have forgotten who he was. Look at the Old Testament. Every story after every story, the Israelites, the Jewish, they always did stupid things and he allowed bad things like, okay, you want to walk away from me. This is what you get. But he was always there going, but come back to me. God has always been on a rescue mission from the day that Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the apple ate the fruit of the tree. We don't know that it was an apple. I think it was an apple. Look at Apple phones. Anyways. Just kidding. Anyways, if you have a Bible, turn with me to Acts chapter 12. We're going to look at this as, as a rescue mission because that's truly what it was. Now, was this somebody that needed to be rescued? Um, no. Because he, he had already been rescued by Jesus. But we're going to see a rescue mission because it's, it's his work. Starting in verse 1. Now about the time that Herod king laid hands on some to, who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And as he did to James, the brother of John, uh, who he put to death with a sword. When he saw that it pleased the Jew, Jewish people, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. The thing that really that catches my attention there is here you have a Roman leader pleasing the Jewish people. Now think about that. The Jewish people were what? The chosen ones. They were the ones that, that God chose in order to proclaim his message. And instead of proclaiming his message about the good news of the Messiah coming and resurrecting, they're deciding to kill him. That's how messed up. So when we look at today's world and we go, this world is jacked up, it's out of control. Guess what? It was 2,000 years ago. It, it was 4,000 years ago. It was 6,000 years ago. See, the world's always been messed up because the minute that sin entered our world, we have lost sight of God. Therefore, the rescue mission began. And we're going to just see one minor example of a rescue mission today. How God saves his people, or one. I, I always, when I read this, I always think of Star Trek. I don't know if you ever watched Star Trek. There was one where Spock dies. And this would have been, I think, late 80s. And I remember that he was standing there with Captain Kirk on the other side. And he said, sometimes it's more important. How did, oh, how did he put it? I just, I just lost it. Sometimes the needs of the few outweigh the needs of the many. And I, I think about that when I read this story because God is going to save just one person. But that one person was someone that he knew he could count on to continue to rescue others. Okay? When he had seized him, he put him in the prison, delivering him to, with four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. So Peter was kept in a prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. Did you see the key there? It doesn't say prayer was being made fervently by Peter's wife. It doesn't say just his family. It says the church. Now, you, you may ask this question, why do I point that out? Because every time in the Old Testament that Israel would be taken over or become captive... 
I'm sure that in thousands of people, some were praying, but many were not. See, it takes the family to pray. Again, just Peter's family or the family? See, whether you like me or not, if you're a Christian, I'm your brother. Yes, I may be like that twerpy brother you don't like. I'm okay with that. But I'm your brother, and you are my brothers and sisters, as we are family because of the blood of Jesus. And it takes the church fervently to be praying. We have many on our prayer list. We had many more added today. When a church comes together and prays, God hears our prayer. Now, I'm not saying he doesn't hear my prayer when I'm in here by myself. I'm not saying God doesn't hear your prayer when you're in your bathroom. God hears it, but God hears it volumes when the church comes together to pray. As leaders of this church, the elders and deacons, and I know the deaconesses, have been praying for many years for this church to grow. We've been praying that we would become the church to be on a rescue mission. Look around today. God is sending people going, I need more trained because I need more workers in the field. Now, you understand that, right? We're in the middle of the corn beans. The fields are getting planted right now, right? We got guys out disking. We got guys out fertilizing. We got guys out already planting. We got guys uh, taking grain in from last year to make room for this year. We're planting on a good season, right? There's not a farmer in here that goes, I'm going to plant and I hope all my crops go bad, right? We plant with the anticipation of a good yield. Christ is planting people in this church for an anticipation of a good yield. So my question, workers of the field, are you ready to go on a rescue mission? Are you truly ready to win others, to preach the gospel, no matter the cost? Why is Peter getting taken to jail? Because he's like me, or I'm like him. We got a big mouth, and we're going to use it for the glory of Jesus, no matter what. No matter what happens. Sheriffs come in right now and take me to to Jasper County for something I said. I guess what's prison ministry is where I'm headed. (laughs) Now you laugh, but it could be coming. If we don't think that that could happen here, then you haven't read the Bible because it happened to the very people that Jesus chose. It can happen. Are you willing to go to jail for the gospel? Or do you go, well, I don't want to go to jail. Trust me, I have spent 56 years keeping myself out of jail. And it's been no easy task on some days. But if I'm going for the gospel of Jesus, bring it. Because that must mean where God needs me. Paul spent many years being incarcerated. Did he shut up and whine and cry about it? Absolutely not. He started making the jailers know Jesus. We have countless examples in our history of people who are incarcerated for the gospel, and in their time in prison or being incarcerated, they continued to preach even at the the thought of knowing they would be beaten. I I think I used recently the example of of the lead founder of Voice of the Martyrs. And I have his, his book and I have his video in there. It's quite an amazing story. He was in Romania as a Lutheran pastor during the time of World War II, and that was becoming a a communist country. He was incarcerated two or three times. He was beaten often. This was Romania, so it wasn't like a country club. Their walls were concrete. Their beds were concrete. No heat in the building, and they were given 
moldy bread to eat. When he finally was released, he was about a third of what he weighed when he went in. And so ill that it took months for him to get better. Did he stop preaching the gospel? No, the reason he was beat so often is every time a new jailer would walk in, he'd say, do you know Jesus? And that, he knew that would buy him a beating. But he did it for the glory of Jesus. How, how ready are we for this rescue mission? As firemen, we trained all the time. New firemen would come in. How fast can you put on your gear? How fast can you don an air pack? How fast can you pull this line or that line? How fast can the engineer get you water and hook a plug? How, how fast can you make entry? Do you know how to open the door? Do you know how to check for the signs of backdraft or a flashover? Do you know how to go up on a roof? Do you know how to throw the ladder correctly? Do you know how to start a chainsaw? Which there's a lot of 20-something-year-olds that don't know how to start a chainsaw. I'm just going to throw that out there. Those were the guys we gave an ax. The other side of it is an axe always starts, right? Got to know how to use an axe. But we trained and we trained and we trained to where it was second nature for us to be sleeping in our bed in a pair of shorts, wake up, put on our uniform, run out, put on our gear, jump in the truck. The engineer would run over to get the, start, the truck started so we could pull out the, the officers, looking up the address, making sure he knows where to go, the quickest route, knowing if there's any road closures or anything that may have happened throughout the night. How can we get there? As soon as we get there, every guy knew his job. The engine would pull up. The fireman, the officer would jump out, pull a hand line, get it to the front door with some tools. The engineer's priming the pump, getting things ready. We had 500 gallons of water, gave us about four minutes of water, depending on the line we pulled. We knew we could get at least in and get a hit. As soon as we found out that there was somebody in the house, everything changed. See, our rescue mission was somewhat determinate on if the house was vacant or empty or if we knew there was someone in there because life hazard was our very first priority. We're just going to start putting put water, wet stuff on the red stuff, right? That's what we do. Firemen show up and put water on the fire. I was not anticipating the man running up to me going, there's a lady upstairs. Everything changed. Every, I, but I had to keep the fire going back because it was advancing quickly. It almost bur burned up our ladder that we threw up. Luckily, within a couple more minutes, we had other companies getting there. It went to a, a three alarm, which means we had multiple agencies there. We had a lot of people. There was a big house and a building in the back with a business that was all connected. Every time you walk out of this building, you're met with the exact same scenario. May, now, maybe not real fire, but you are met with people that are headed to the fire. That the fire is going con to consume if we as Christians aren't ready for the rescue mission. Are you ready to join God's fire brigade and be ready for the rescue mission? Let's keep going. So Peter was kept in prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church of God. On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping with two soldiers, bound with two chains, and guards in front of the door were watching the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared, and a light shone in the cell, and he struck up, he struck Peter's side. Now, I find somewhat of this comical. <laughs> He struck Peter's side. Like, come on, man, where are you sleeping? Peter was able to sleep knowing he was going to die the next day because he knew where he was going. Peter was able to rest, not going, man, I hope I get to heaven. Peter knew where he was going, and he's like, if today's the day, so be it. God be the glory. Peter was able to sleep knowing what was about to happen. But yet, it was not his time. Let's keep going. Behold, the angel of the Lord suddenly appeared and kicked him in the side and said, Peter, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hand. And the angel said to him, gird yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow. But he did not know what was being done by the angel was actually real for he thought it was a vision. And when they had passed the first and second guard and came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which 
which opened for them by itself, and they went out and along the street, and immediately the angel departed from him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Holy shnike, I'm out of jail. That wasn't a dream. That was a rescue mission. God has more work for me to get done. Praise God. I want to go home. Paul said that. I want to go home. I'm, I, I struggle with staying here because where I'm going is so much better. But as long as God gives me breath, as long as God gives me work, my hands will get dirty and I will do the work that the Lord calls me to. Now I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hands of Herod and from all the Jewish people that were, and what they were expecting. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were sleeping and were making dinner and were watching Netflix. Nope. What were they doing? Praying fervently. God was like, it's you guys again? I, oh, you're so loud. No, God loves hearing his saints pray. He rejoices in the prayers that are being lifted up to him, and he hears them. God hears every one of your prayers, but when a church comes together, when the people come together, it's like a megaphone in heaven. And, and I don't know about you guys, the weather's been nice, I'll be honest, I've been in the old truck with the windows down and the window cranked. There ain't nothing better than keeping my arm hung out the window, getting a nice little farmer's tan on one side so I look like a moron, and then having the, the music up. I love that. It's beautiful outside, right? That's the way it is in heaven when the church prays in unison. It is that loud. I'm the guy that's got the really crummy speakers that rattle real bad when you hear me at the stop sign. <laughs> that's me. But to God, those megaphones are amplifying, and God hears us. You know who else hears us? Jesus hears us. You know who else hears us? The Holy Spirit hears us. You know who else hears us? All of heaven hears our prayers. That's revelation. you got to just look it up. That's, that's your homework assignment. All right, so let's keep going. When he knocked at the door, and I see, so in this story, I see the angel, get up. I see, I see some humor here. I love this part. When he knocked on the door of the gate, the servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, she did not open the gate. Hey, let me in. It's Bill. Woo! Uh, I'm, I'm still here. The guards are coming. Could you let me in the door? I love that. That to me is just that. That's like the comical relief of the story. But she ran in and announced that Peter was standing at the front gate. But they said to her, you're crazy, girl. You're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that they were there. But they kept saying, you know what? It's an angel. Now, I have a question. If, if one of your kids ran in right now and said, Simon Peter's at the door, would you go open it? Let me ask you this. If one of your kids just ran in and said, there's an angel at the front door, would you just sit there and go, eh, it's just an angel? Wouldn't you be running toward the door even? Okay, it's Simon Peter, but it's an angel. Nah, it's fine. They know the back door. I, I, mean, I look at this and I'm like, why are they not like running to even? Okay, so, but it, it's just an angel. How do you just say it's just an angel? But, but Peter continued knocking, and when he had opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. But he motioned to them in his hand to be silent. He described to them how the Lord had led him out of the prison, and he said to these things, report these things to James and, James and the brethren, and then he left and went to another place. Now when the day came, there was no small disturbance among the soldiers as to what could have become of Peter. I don't know about you guys, but I read this story, this rescue mission, and I, I see, you know, I, I remember several years ago they had, you know, the, those commercials for the Bibles. It's got humor, it's got drama, it's got love stories. It's, 
this one's kind of like a movie to me. Like, I think we can make truly a Netflix movie or a, or a pure flix movie out of this. It's got, it's got a little bit of humor. It's got a little bit of comedy. But it's got the truth to say that God wants to rescue each and every one of you. Right now, if you call yourself a Christian, if you've been, if you've been giving your life to Christ, if you've been baptized and you, you were washed clean, but are still struggling with something, with sin, God wants to rescue you. God doesn't want you to carry those burdens. See, Jesus took those. Last, we talked about that last week, right? Jesus took those burdens upon himself that Friday night. J Jesus took your sin from you. You don't have to carry that anymore. Peter was sitting there chained to two guards, having more guards out front going, there's no way I'm getting out of this. And he was comfortable enough to fall asleep when it first happened, he thought in his slumber that it was just a dream, didn't realize how real the experience was. Why? Because he knew that Jesus had cleansed him. He knew that he was clean and he knew where he was going. Christians, do you know where you're going for sure? Right now, can you stand up and adamantly say, I know where I'm going and ain't nobody taking me anywhere else? Chain me to two guards. Tell me I'm dying tomorrow. Whatever, I know where I'm going. Now, now we do know the rest of the story, right? Peter would eventually be re-imprisoned after he went and did a whole bunch more stuff and proclaimed the gospel to more people and won more souls to Jesus. He will be martyred. We know that he was martyred. And he rejoiced in the fact that he could give his life for Christ. Truly give his life for Christ. How about you? I'm not saying that I'm like, woohoo, crucify me. That sounds like fun. But I know where I'm going. There's no doubt in my mind. Jesus made it very clear that I am his child. Jesus rescued me. I won't bore you with all the details I, I have in the past. Jesus rescued me. He rescued me from sin. And you know what? He also rescued me from myself. Because I'm my own worst enemy. I make horrible decisions sometimes. I do stupid things. But Jesus saved me from me. And now I am his. Peter was rescued on this rescue mission because God knew that he could count on him to continue to proclaim his gospel. Can God count on you guys? Can God know that each and every one in here is on a rescue mission and is ready to do the work that he gives you? That's my question for you today. Rescue missions are exciting. I'll be honest. That fire, and, and I've got many more stories as, as everybody that's ever done most work and done anything like that has stories. But that's one that was, for me, the craziest rescue story that I had. And I'll never forget it. But as crazy as that rescue story was, the rescue story that a man 2,000 years ago would give himself for me. That's crazy. That's love. How do I not repay that? Now, I don't have to. It doesn't, I can't buy my way into heaven. But, but how do I, I not give back to that person that saved me from myself, from, that saved me from my stupidity, my arrogance, my ignorance, my lack of humility? That's my question for you today. Is are you ready to be on the team? And if you're on the team, we got work to do. We got work to do. There's a whole world out there right now. And we could say, look at this church and praise God it's filling up. And I thank God for each and every one of you being here. But we need more. 
because for every minute, you know, there's a stat of how many people die in our country and in the world every second of every minute of every day. How many of them are lost? How many of them, if, a, if somebody from the church would have just proclaimed the gospel to them and told them they could be free, they could be saved, they could never die, I wonder how many of them never heard the gospel. I wonder how many in our area right now have not heard the gospel of Jesus. So, fire department, time to get busy. We got some work to do. Father, we thank you for this example of Peter. We thank you for this example of of one of your apostles that that was kind of okay knowing where he was headed. He, he was able to sleep knowing that the, the next day he, his life would be over. Father, if we have that kind of comfortability that, that we know where we're going, then, and then I pray, Father, that we, we bring more with us. Help us to proclaim your gospel, the gospel of Jesus to a world that's so hurting a world that doesn't know love, a world that doesn't know peace or comfort. Father, I pray for each and every one here. I pray that you put it heavy on their heart to be part of the team. I pray, Father, that you would put someone on them right now, heavy, that they can be praying for, that we as a church can fervently pray for. And I pray, Father, through that, that they not only would be saved, but that you would be glorified. And help us, Father, to pack heaven full. That we may have just an amazing eternity with you. Father, we do praise you for Jesus. We thank you for his love. We thank you for his forgiveness. We pray, Father, for the Spirit now. Fill us to the brim. Make our hair, if we have it, tingle. That we would be in your service and ready to serve our King. We thank you, Father, and we just offer this in Jesus, holy and blessed and amazing and awesome and pure and just the name of Jesus, we call on Jesus now. We thank you and we love you and we ask this in his name. Amen.